So hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm um, delighted to see such a full room on a Monday at noon. Uh, we are uh, delighted to open this event uh, of the uh, Center for the Study of the United States at Tel Aviv University with the Fulbright program, also co-sponsored by the International Program in Conflict Resolution and Mediation. Uh, we want to thank the uh, staff at the center, uh, Margarita, Medeline, and the rest of the staff. We want to uh, thank Corey and Yonit from the International Program, the U.S. Embassy in Israel, and, uh, uh, and the Fulbright Program. Uh, we have uh, Professor Jennifer Hoffman here, who I'm going to introduce in a, uh, in a, a second, and then we have a panel of, uh, of experts from different areas of sports uh, in Israel. Uh, we are uh, interested in understanding uh, issues of sports equity in the United States, but also in comparison to the Israeli scene. Uh, and as uh, the title of the talk talks about both uh, promise and peril, we'll touch on both. Uh, the uh, structure for the, for, the, uh, for the event today will be about 30, 35 minute talk by Professor Hoffman. Then we'll open it for uh, comments by the, uh, by the panelists, about five minutes each. And then uh, after that, we'll open it for uh, questions and answers. Unless before Professor Hoffman will have to, will, will like to respond to some of the panelists, and then we'll open it for uh, for Q and A. Uh, we have people here from uh, so the the the, so the event is uh, also uh, hosted by uh, a class that I teach, which is why you see so many students here. It's about Israeli politics and society. So we have uh, our students here. In addition, we have. Uh, guests from the U.S. Embassy so, and, and guests from uh, the United States. I'd like to uh, welcome them and just uh, recognize their presence. So we have uh, Adi Fargason, Stephanie Arroyo, uh, Kevin Long, Gerald Grant, Erin McCaskin, Rachel uh, Paris Lambert, and our friends from the U.S. Embassy, Omar uh, Benzioni and Ethan Schiffman. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, and. Uh, so Professor Hoffman is an associate professor uh, in the College of Education and the Center for Leadership in Athletics at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on the role of leadership within higher education, including research and teaching in the areas of intercollegiate athletics, women in leadership, and data-informed decision-making. As she attests about herself, she is witness to the amazing reach and the deeply entrenched challenges of colleges and universities and he's still curious about why are there so few power five women athletic directors. She loves hiking, biking, camping, backpacking, paddling, and skiing. So we had some interesting conversations with her in my office about the options that Israel offers in these fields. And our current uh, role model is Esther Ledeka. Uh, our panelists today are Vered Buskila, who's a three-time Olympic athlete and the uh, vice president of the Israeli Olympic Committee. Verit is a world champion in sailing who also participated in three Olympic Games. Uh, Mr. Gaia Zuri is the head coach for the Israeli Women's Soccer National Team and the head of the Israeli, Israeli National Soccer Academy for Girls. And Mr. Lior Bartal is a sports correspondent for Davarishon. He writes about the social aspects in sports with a special emphasis on women's soccer in Israel and, inter and internationally. So we'd like to welcome Verit Buskila, Gaia Zuri, and Lior uh, Bartal here, and I think we'll start uh, with the talk. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So thank you so much for that really kind introduction. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here today. I also want to extend my thanks and gratitude um, to the U.S. Embassy for bringing myself and my colleagues here from the Sports Diplomacy Program, as well as members from the, an organization called World Learning. Um, another organization called the World American Council, Council that have made it possible for my colleagues and I to be here today. Um, so the title of my talk, as you can see, is a separate but uh, can separate be equal: the promise and the peril of equity for women in sports. And so I'll talk a little bit about both the promise for gender equity as well as some of the lessons that we've learned over several years, almost um, five, almost 50 years, five decades of having Title IX in the U.S. Um, can we advance the next slide, please? So this quote is one that I absolutely love. Um, it's from Dr. Judy Conrad. Um, she was a longtime athletic administrator at the University of Texas in their athletic program. Um, and for many, many years in US colleges and universities, we would have separate programs for men and, um, and separate programs for women. And under that arrangement, she was the women's athletic director for decades. 
and she has really put her finger on a challenge that we see when we're trying to achieve equity in spaces and places where we also want to honor difference. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about Title IX. Um, I'll explain the American co context for the policy. I'll explain a bit about how it operates um, and the ways in which it really has been powerful for achieving equity and equality for women in sports. <coughs> Then I'll take a few moments and speak a bit about women in leadership outside of sports, and then I'll come back and conclude with some remarks about the ways in which we might think about gender equity and things that you might think about for gender equity in your settings in the ways in which we want to fulfill promise through policy um, and, try, and try to avoid some of the pitfalls that we sometimes might see, um, some of the unexpected consequences of policy. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you so much. So as I begin, I want you to think about the last time you witnessed an athletic event. Maybe you were an athlete, maybe you were participating in the competition. Maybe you had a son or a daughter participating in that sport. Maybe you were watching on television, maybe on your mobile device, maybe you were there in person. I want you to think about who were the athletes. Imagine those athletes. I also want you to think about the coaches, the referees or the judges, and who was in the stands. I want you to think about that sport and who might be organizing that sport. Who made that event possible? And as you picture in your mind, maybe it was lacrosse, maybe it was basketball, it was a swimming event. When you think about those sports and you think and you imagine that um, event in your mind, think about the ways in which gender hides in plain sight. If you attended a swimming event, there may have been men's races and women's races. If you were watching a basketball game, there was probably a women's team or a men's team. And we don't really actually think about that. We just, we know we want to see the event, we go and watch, and we know it's going to be a team of one gender or the other. Now think about the coaches and maybe the managers or the directors of those programs. If it's a coach that we're imagining in our mind, probably many of you thought of a coach, you probably thought of a man, no matter whether it was a women's team or a men's team. Now, if it had been a woman coaching a men's team, then we would have really noticed, because that's less common. When you think about those sports, who might be the directors or the managers? When you think about those sports, who are the judges? Who are the referees? And most often, we imagine men in those other positions, whether it's a women's team or a men's team. When we think about sport, we often don't notice gender, but Title IX has really, in the US context, ensured participation, opportunities for women, and it ensures participation in a gender separate context, which is the ways in which most of us are accustomed to sport. So I'm gonna talk about the policy a little bit, but I want you to remember as I go through my remarks this morning about the ways in which gender is always present. So Title IX, as much as we know about sports in the US, we can often attribute women's participation to Title IX. We think of women's sports and we think of opportunity and the, what put in place that opportunity, we often pivot directly to Title IX. But it's actually an education policy. The policy itself covers many areas of education, but the primary impetus was not athletics in the beginning. The, uh, the official title of the legislation is Title IX of the Am Educational Amendments Act of 1972, but it was written by a woman named Patsy Mink, and later the law was named in her honor. You see, Patsy Mink was a young woman um, prior uh, in the 1960s, and she applied to medical school. She had all of the qualifications, but she was denied admission because of her gender. So her next step, she thought about, that it was, it was unfair that she was denied uh, admission because of her gender, so she tried to go to law school so she could change law. She was also denied admission to law school. She finally made her way to Congress uh, in the United States representing the state of Hawaii, and she and other legislators came together, and their intent was to provide access for women in education and permit, pre prevent discrimination against gender in any aspect of education. And so if you read this 36 words here, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, 
or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal assistance. That's the law. There's many, many guidelines that support the law, but sport does not apply, or sport does not appear anywhere in the legislation. And yet we know it has had huge effect for the opportunities for women. So when we do think about sport and the ways in which Title IX protects women, not only in education, but when we think about the ways it protects women in sport, we know that there are three criteria within our educational institutions for Title IX to apply. So first of all, it must be an educational institution. So an elementary school, a secondary school, or a college or university. It has to be an educational institution. Secondly, it has to be a co-educational institution. In other words, a single gender campus is not under the jurisdiction of Title IX because there's um, almost no likelihood of gender discrimination. And third, federally funded program. So for the, the three criteria, it must be an education program. There must be the opportunity or the presence of uh, gender discrimination. And there must be some sort of federal funds that are attached to the, to the institution. And the ways in which this happens is either through federal grants that are given directly to institutions, or it could be through students, either by um, grants and scholarships that they receive for their education, or if we're talking about the secondary schools, through free and reduced lunch programs. So you must have all three of these to apply. Now, the landscape of U.S. Um, higher education is around 4,000, 4,500 institutions. So this is a broad, wide-reaching policy. Most of those institutions must comply. So as I spoke about a moment ago, Title IX is really only one of ten items within those educational institutions. Um, athletics is only one of those ten items where institutions must comply. But at the very top of the list is access to education. I want to point that out, and um, we'll come back to that in a moment. But it also covers um, seven, eight other areas of education. So it's a wide-reaching policy, over 4,000 institutions, and only one of its tenants is in athletics. So how does it apply to athletics? It applies in three main areas. Um, the first one is participation. So think about um, any university you have men and women attending institutions. And so uh, Title IX protects, uh, for athletics, it protects that participation opportunity just as much or just similarly as it would for protecting enrollment and access to education. So one of the key tenets um, for Title IX for athletics is that it protects women's opportunity to compete as athletics on behalf of their institution. I'm going to drop down to scholarships next. If you are an athlete attending a U.S. college or university and you are competing for your athletic program, you are, e you are, if you are a woman, you are equally entitled to scholarship resources. Now it's not a dollar for dollar exchange or equity, um, but women athletes are entitled to the same proportion and consistency and distribution of, of scholarship resources as men athletes. There's lots of different ways in which scholarships are allocated and how the funds are distributed and we can talk about that during, during Q&A for the fine details. But what we see in the US is that men tend to garner more of the scholarship dollars, but the law, law requires that those dollars are distributed um, around uh, sort of an equitable or a consistent uh, manner. And then the last thing is the program benefits. And for program benefits, um, this is another 11 items. So everything that a, a modern athlete at a highly competitive athletic program might need access to, Title IX protects women and protects their athletic opportunity that they are entitled to all of these benefits. And the second item there on the list is coaching. And what's really, really important about the distinction here is not that it protects coaches, it protects women athletes and their access to coaches. And that's an important distinction that we'll come to in a few moments. So when we think about participation, it is inarguably a resounding success. Title IX, with its force, being able to protect women's opportunity at 4,000 colleges and universities across the U.S. has meant huge gains for women's opportunity in education. And when we look at their opportunity in education with regard to athletic participation, you can see that between 1972 and 2018, the growth for high school girls is immeasurable. Um, 
just under 300,000 in 1972 um, and over 3 million today. Incredible growth. The data from 1972 to 2018 that I'm showing you here is for the NCAA. We do have other governing associations. Um, the data is not as easy to discern from the starting point of 1972. But when we look at NCAA institutions, we are looking at now about 1,100 institutions that offer an athletic program that competes in the NCAA. And you can see that prior to 1972, there was about 30,000 women athletes competing, and today it's over 200,000. So again, huge growth for women athletes in terms of participation. Now I spoke at length that it protects women's opportunity in education, and that has been its primary hallmark. But it is also undeniable to think about the influence that this policy, this education policy has had for women inside of sport, out, but outside of the US. So this is just one example. So we looked at rosters of women that, of uh, the teams in North America that, uh, that were trying to get into the, that were in the qualifying rounds for the uh, Women's World Cup. Um, and in Canada, two thirds, uh, 19 women, have college experience in the US. They attended a college or a university in the United States. They played on a women's soccer team. They enjoyed all of those benefits and a college scholarship. They may not have come to US for that kind of training without time. <coughs> in US, of our squad, um, there's actually 23 women on the squad. 22 women have college experience. The one woman that doesn't have college experience is still in high school. So as we look at uh, her trajectory over her career, we'll probably also include some college experience. Um, and then the last um, country there is Mexico. And their uh, data on women participating in college sports varies. Uh, in 2011, the World Cup, it was seven. And then the last World Cup, 2015, it was actually closer to two thirds, much more like Canada. So they have more variation. But without Title IX, uh, Canada and Mexico would not enjoy the same benefits that the US women have. You could also say the same thing for any other number of sports around the world for women that have the opportunity to come to us, receive a college scholarship, and get high-level elite training. When we think about Title IX, we think about women. We think about their participation. What is also unseen and what also hides in plain sight is this very unusual phenomenon where we have actually seen a decline in women's coaching and a decline in what we call athletic administrators, what you might call directors or managers. When I talked about the program benefits, I highlighted coaching. And that's because Title IX protects access to coaching. But Title IX is limited. It only protects women athletes. Now, there are other laws that pro prohibit gender discrimination um, for coaches uh, and managers, but it does not ensure that women have access to a woman coach. And Title IX is a really interesting case in U.S. because prior to Title IX, when I, remember I mentioned we had those two, so we had those separate athletic departments? You would have a men's department with a men's athletic director and men's coaches. You'd have a women's athletic department with, women, with a women's athletic director and women's coaches. Now the scope and scale was different. So the men's programs were much more elevated. Women's programs were really struggling for all of those benefits, the participation opportunities, and the scholarship dollars. So Title IX really played a huge role in elevating the scale and the status for those women athletes. But Title IX as a policy does not protect uh, women in coaching. And we have seen this decline. Um, almost 90% of all programs were coached by a woman in 1972. And when you get to the present day, only 40% of all women athletes at an NCAA institution are coached by a head coach who's a woman. And then you can see the same growth trajectory for women athletes, and that's leveled out. So our proportion of our student athlete population, if you look at all NCAA institutions, we still have a ways to go in terms of promoting more participation opportunity for women, but there's been this convergence for participation opportunities around 43%. So one of the things we have to think about, um, one of the questions is why have we seen this decline in women coaches? And I'll continue to share some of my thoughts on that. But when we step back and think about the policy itself and the ways in which it was trying to solve a problem, we were trying to solve the problem 
of access and opportunity for women in education. So when you're gonna design policy, or if you're gonna think about the ways in which we would uh, design gender equity policy today, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And then what's the foundation or the philosophy in which that particular policy is going to be based? And when you look at Title IX, it relies on something that's called liberal feminist theory. Now there's many, many theories around feminism and many, many theories that have come around in the um, several decades since then. But in the 1960s and early 70s, liberal feminist thought really drove the, the changes in which we uh, generated policy in, in that time period. And so a liberal feminist approach really does rely on mandate to push social change. So really relies on mandate to push the ways in which institutions behave and the ways in which we created access for women to education. It addresses inequality with a legal um, or political, it, it addresses inequality with a legal lever. It uses the force of the law to emphasize the rights of individuals. And then finally, it emphasizes gender similarity to give women equal access to what men have. So if you think back to the ways in which I described Title IX, we ensure, Title IX policy ensures that women athletes get what the men athletes have. And we also are emphasizing the athletes as individuals, and we are also using the force of the law to ensure that that happens. But when you step back, and you think about those athletes, and you think about the force of the law, we are definitely in this zone of policy. And we have used policy in the United States through Title IX to really invoke social change. <coughs> if you fast forward to today and even to next summer with the Women's World Cup coming up, it would be really, really difficult to imagine a Women's World Cup with all of the splendor and the grandeur that it is going to invoke worldwide without the force of policy to push social change. Now some folks, um, particularly legal experts, will say that maybe a better use of law is to wait for social change and then use law to make sure it matches the current social climate of the day. But what we've seen with, with Title IX is if you build that policy, it will then have that intended effect of pushing social change. Now the policy itself does not actually come with any funding attached. So individual institutions have to figure out how to reallocate funds or allocate funds for women's opportunity. And so that's where there's kind of a dotted line there. Because of the force of Title IX with all of its strength, it doesn't actually provide any funding to institutions. But it has forced them to make changes and make those resource allocations for women athletes. But when we think about our coaches, our directors and managers, Title IX has not had the same force. That's because Title IX does not actually protect their rights as individuals. Instead, what we relied on is social change to help sustain systems that would then help women remain in those positions. And what we found with Title IX is that trajectory over the last 50 years, social change has not been enough to support the systems that would then, in fact, promote and support women in coaching and leadership. And this phenomenon about the drop-off of women coaches is not just unique to Title IX. It's not unique to US colleges and universities. When we look at the global top context for women in sport, we know that we have, still, we have struggled to build from the ground up more opportunities for women coaches and women managers. And so, as I mentioned at the, at the outset, I asked you to think about the ways in which gender hides in plain sight. There's been a movement at the international level um, among something called the International Women's Group to both identify this as a challenge and put light on it so that it does not hide. And the ways in which they're doing this is they're doing something called the Sydney Scoreboard, which is a global index of who's populating the leadership boards for national sport organizations. So instead of letting gender hide in plain sight at the national and international level, this index helps us see where we have inequity. And so not only did they um, develop um, ways to, not only have they measured it, but they developed the criteria to measure it as well. So there's an index for board members. So if you have a balanced board of one of your national sport organi organizing groups, um, it would have 40 to 60% of those seats occupied by women. 
it's tilted if you've got about 20 to 40 percent of those seats occupied by women. It would be considered skewed if less than 20 percent of those seats are occupied by a woman, and it would be considered uniform if all members were of the same gender. Now what's also important that we know from research is that to have um, significant change in thinking, you need to have a critical mass. So it's not just the gender of the individuals that are sitting on the board, but you need a critical mass of at least 30% of a different voice on a board to invoke changes in thinking. And so we know this from research about studying corporate boards from around the world for several decades. So you need to have that zone of at least that tilted zone to have any board, not just people occupying the seats, but to have an expectation about the ways in which decision making might be changed. So when we look at the data, looking at the Sydney Scoreboard Global Index, they looked at 45 national sport organizations. And you can see that overall, when they took all 45 institutions, the global mean is about 20%. So we are still in that skewed zone in terms of looking at all of the boards. Only one board um, made it to the balanced category. And then you can see that um, nearly half the boards are in that tilted category, but they're not all achieving that critical mass, and the other half of the boards really need to have strategies that are going to then promote more women to those leadership positions. So I'm going to step outside of sport for just a moment, and I want you to think about those boards, and I want you to think about the ways in which populating individuals on these boards may or may not have an effect. So what do we know about leadership and decision making, particularly when we're looking at corporate boards or nonprofit boards, and what lessons can we learn and apply that to sport? So that we know that gender is actually not a predictor of leadership effectiveness. So simply putting more women on the boards is probably not going to be enough to ensure that boards will have some effectiveness in their leadership. But however, we do know that when you have more women populating boards, this research is from something called uh, the Ketchum Leadership Communications Monitor, and we know that women actually outrank men in three of the top five leadership characteristics. Those characteristics are using open and transparent communication, leading by example, and willing to admit, admit mistakes. So not only do we need to think about how we're going to populate boards with more women, but we need to have an opportunity to also recognize that by having more women on these boards, we have a greater likelihood that member all members of the board, regardless of gender, are going to have a greater opportunity to exhibit these characteristics. And particularly around sport, we know that men and women rank equally well in calmness and confidence when handling controversial issues. So certainly this would apply to our boards, but we also can think about the ways in which sport really requires calmness and confidence under high pressure situations when it might be the last three to five seconds of a basketball game when your team has the ball and the game is tied. So we know that both men and women have capacity for calmness and confidence regardless of what the decision is. What we saw in the case of Title IX is the ways in which gender norms are steering men toward particular leadership roles that tend to be more agenic and task oriented. And as a society, we tend to associate that kind of leadership with men. And we know that gender norms steer women more to these interpersonal roles. And we saw that in the case of Title IX, when the departments were combined, not only were women positioned in those interpersonal roles, but over time as those um, positions changed, changed over, more women were brought in to those interpersonal and communal roles, and more men were brought into the top level where we associate those roles with these gender norms. We know from the research that men and women <coughs> are equally capable of, of both characteristics, but gender norms are, help, are positioning people in particular categories. So last, I want to transition to thinking about the future and give you some food for thought and, and hand it over to the panel for some remarks. So think back to that opening scenario you imagined a sport or a team. There's a power matrix and there's a range of stakeholders that are embedded in all of our sport organizations and the ways in which as a culture we consume sport and we think about sport. 
This power matrix is present both with our board members, which I gave quite a bit of attention to a moment ago. Our coaches are embedded in this. Our athletes are embedded in this. Our athletes are a real source of power. <coughs> There's also a whole other host of individuals and stakeholders. We have vendors in our stadiums, we have sponsors of our events, fans, the media, our governments also have a role in this sports power matrix. And what we need to be thinking about is not so much the individuals that are occupying these positions, but what are the ways in which power is circulating in these, and what are the ways in which we can use the levers, whether it be policy, social change, systems, or economics, to achieve the gender equity outcomes we are seeking. So as I mentioned, when we're thinking about leadership positions, when we're thinking about our coaches, our managers, if our desire is to use gender equity policy as a way to promote more gender equity in our sport organizations, then we have to think about the levers that are available to us. We know that policy can be extremely powerful. We saw this evidence with Title IX. But we also know that you can't just rely on one lever. You have to pull the levers of, the, of economic resources. You have to think about social change and the ways in which consumers and athletes are gonna demand opportunity. We also have to think about the systems that leave individuals to rise or to fall. We should not be leaving it up to any one individual to represent the rest of their gender or look to any one individual as a particular problem. What we need to think about, what are the systems that are promoting some individuals to our coaching ranks, to our leadership ranks, and what are the systems that are not helping women rise to those ranks? So to conclude, if we really want to think about having difference we have gender separation in sport. If we really want to achieve equity within that difference, we have to pull on all of these levers. We have to think about what's the gender equity problem we are trying to solve, and what are our options in trying to address that issue, and what might be the foundations that are, are informing the decisions that we're making so that we can also see some of the under, unexpected, unexpected consequences that might be coming. Um, thank you so much, Professor Lopez, for really an inspiring and insightful talk. talk. I think that uh, many of the insights uh, obviously apply to the United States, but apply to, uh, to the Israeli case and to many cases around the world. Uh, I think that uh, we can all agree that participation of women in sports contributes broadly to their standard of living, to their health, self-esteem, and empowerment, to the point where the status of women in sports reflects their status in society in many ways. And as such, a continued effort to achieve equity is important to everyone, women and men, both on the field and off, as your talk in many, in many ways uh, uh, reflected. Uh, I think I'm going to hand it over to, the, uh, to our panelists now. Uh, each of them is going to have about five minutes for uh, his or her comments, and then we'll open it for <coughs> questions unless you will have any uh, responses to their talk. So, Guy, why don't you go first, please? Thanks. Lady first, okay. <laughs> Um, I was thinking to tell a little bit about my personal story as a young uh, athlete. Um, growing up uh, in the city of Batyam, I, I wasn't aware about uh, gender. I wasn't thinking about in gender way. I was just thinking about how, how I'm going to be the best athlete I can. Um, nowadays when I'm growing, and that was the atmosphere uh, I lived and that's the, how I look at myself, I always, I remember as a young girl, I always said, there's, not, there's no difference between girls and boys, there's no difference between sailors and men and women. That's um, something, it's like a mantra, because I remember uh, people used to ask me if I have a women role model or um, all, all kinds of gender questions, really uh, at a young age, and I was just dismissing it. Um, and when I got a little bit older and I looked about the challenges that I used to face, uh, now I understand that maybe in Olympic uh, sailing there are no difference between uh, men and women budget-wise or policy, but definitely the challenges that I faced was, were uh, with some gender flavor. 
Um, since most of the challenges I had as an athlete were, uh, were regarding the relationship that I had with my coach. And I'm, now I understand with the tools that I have and the maturity that, uh, first of all, I grew up in a house with uh, both, both of my parents were very, very much present in my life. But since I uh, had to, um, to be very independent early age and to, uh, to live a lot abroad, away from home, the main uh, figure, adult figure in my life was my coach. Uh, he uh, pushed me, he, he nurtured me, he taught me everything I know, he brought me to sailing. Um, and he had a lot of influence um, about my life as an athlete and as a woman. So he was the first male figure I knew. Um, and now when I think back and I, knew, and I know that most of the challenges that I had were regarding uh, uh, self-image, like uh, all, all kinds of, uh, uh, I had uh, eating disorders and a lot of uh, issues regarding uh, my uh, feminism. And the relationship with him probably didn't uh, contribute a lot to that uh, situation. So I do understand now that probably if I had more uh, female uh, role models around me growing up as an athlete, or if I was more aware um, of the, the challenges that my coach as a, as a man coach had facing me, I think we, we would uh, probably reach to a better results in our relationship and also uh, in sports and definitely in life. But I think that's kind of uh, the consequences that you are able to understand only looking back and uh, going a little bit farther away from the problem. But during my career, that was definitely something that I, I struggled with a lot. Thank you. Every yeah. question to do you feel that if you had a woman coach that uh, follow you the whole career, you would achieve more or, or less? It's a uh, very difficult and uh, quite, uh, I think it's very difficult to say one or another, but I do believe that um, the way that I was coached uh, wasn't the right way to coach an athlete um, because uh, they try it was it wasn't only the coach it was the whole system um the chairman of the federation and i was surrounded by strong men that uh, i had a really hard time just putting boundaries uh and to tell them and they kind of used not intentionally by the way but they used my uh gender as uh, against me and not encouraging me uh, from my strengths but pointing always on my weaknesses and uh, and I think that if if you are facing it in, with a uh, female coach it you take it differently as a woman I think uh, uh, he had it had a lot of influence about uh, the way I I uh, percepted myself okay uh, I have a uh you know, I can say one thing. First of all, I coached 22 years uh, men and six years uh, women. I started playing in, uh, when I was eight years old in Maccabi, <laughs> which is the biggest club in Israel. In my career, I got an offer uh, after I finished uh, serving in the army to, went to go to college, United States of Maine University. And, uh, uh, when I was 21, I was just eight years, I finished in the state. Um, I finished my career because of very bad injury when I was 27, and since then I'm coaching. Um, I came back to Israel, coaching professionally here, um, about, uh, about the, as I said, 22 years I'm involved, I'm involved in, uh, in men, and uh, Six years ago, six years ago, six years ago, I got an offer from the Israel Association. Uh, I got the call from the chairman, and he told me, "Guy, I need you for a special project. We are hosting the European Championship in Israel, 2015. 
and I want to bring somebody known in Israel, somebody known that did uh, work in top clubs, and uh, someone that can change uh, the image and to prepare the team uh, to perform uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way in a championship when Israel is not in this level already. Because as an example, we have now maybe 2,000 players, uh, girls playing uh, uh, soccer in Israel. And uh, you know how many in the United States and how many in Europe. Uh, so we had to play in two years. We had to prepare a national team uh, with all the problems, with all the differences. Uh, and to compete against France, Sweden, and Denmark. This is our group, top, top teams in the world. And in two years, we opened the first academy in Israel. We opened the first academy in Israel in the Winget Institute. And in uh, two years, we just prepare this team, okay, to this championship. Because we understood that this, this uh, kind of championship can uh, change the image and everything what people think about women soccer in Israel. Um, so uh, we did, in my opinion, tremendous job, okay, because the, the association was afraid, they're afraid that we are going to lose 10, 15, 0 against this kind of teams, and then, you know, the image of the, of the soccer, the women's soccer will uh, destroy. So uh, we, we performed very, very, uh, uh, very, very good in this, uh, in this championship. Uh, we compete against them, sure, we, we couldn't win games against uh, these kind of uh, teams, but even in the last game against Denmark, we lost only 2-1. And I, I don't like to say we lost only, okay? This is, a, I don't feel good with this world, but in Israel, in the situation, where we are, this is a big, big result for us. Um, and uh, after uh, two years, the Association of Israel saw the success of the academy, saw the like 3,000 people almost came to every game. It's a huge number in Israel. Um, and they decided to continue with the academy. So until now, six years since then, the academy is uh, uh, continuing a very nice success. The, the women, the, the U17, U19, uh, all the time, uh, getting better and better. Uh, we came from 44 in Europe, in uh, U19 to 28. Um, so all the time, it's an improvement. In the in the top in the top uh, uh, soccer in Israel, and the A team is we have a problem because it's a semi-professional. Uh, they they compete in semi-professional league here. Uh, the the girls don't train as we want them to train because they need to work. They need to bring money. They go to work. Everyone go to work. Okay, nobody just uh, playing uh, soccer and that's it. They go to work. They go to study. Uh, so it's very difficult uh, to bring them to the level of, uh, of Europe or, or, or in the state. Um, as, as someone that's ever uh, experienced a lot of experience with men, and now I can say a lot of experience with women, um, it's a lot of differences in, 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 the, in the when you compare uh, soccer women and uh, soccer men. And I would say the image is the biggest problem in, in Israel. Uh, in the six years when I, I look back six years ago, uh, it's big different from six years ago to now. Okay, in the image. Okay, six years ago, I think a parent that uh, his girl play uh, play soccer was maybe a little bit ashamed even to say my girl play soccer. In the state, it's to be proud. You know, my girl is a soccer player. Okay, and here in Israel, the image is very bad, even terrible. Okay, now. You can see change. You can see a little bit change. You can see more girls playing soccer in the neighborhood. More players go to play. Don't feel ashamed to play the game. It's a long way to go, but still, uh, we are far. I think in in, in a few aspects in the Israel uh, uh, culture, we are a little bit primitive in, in the way of thinking of uh, of uh, sport of uh, women, girls, and uh, it was uh, all the six years I. I I have to fight all the time with people. I have to fight with the with the association. I have to fight with people all the time. Uh, that's, this is game. It's the same. It's the same for them. Give them the tools. Give them the opportunities. Give them the money. Okay. <laughs> and and in women, as I told you, in two years, what we did in two years is just an example. What I think you, you can do more with women than men, as far as uh, when you reach them, 
and when you get inside of them, I think sky is the limit of what you, what you can achieve uh, with women. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something for me, as someone that did this, uh, did the men and uh, uh, work with women, uh, I, feel, I feel that uh, this experience gave me, okay, as, as a coach with a lot of experience, okay, gave me a lot of tools for the future. Um, and I think, I think the women soccer uh, can be, okay, with a lot of help of the government, and the association could be in a, a, a somewhere else, uh, but still, it's long way to go, long way to go. Uh, but uh, for me, it's hope. It's hope that uh, it can be changed, and uh, hope for a lot of girls. It's really wants to play the game, but they are not sure because of the image. They are not sure because of a lot of things. Um, that's for me will be in the, in the future to see the change come to Israel. Uh, this will be something very big. Guy, thanks a lot. So on this note of uh, effort from the government and uh, uh, on this kind of, uh, of things, I think uh, the Oba Tal, our last speaker for today, uh, has a lot to say. Phil, do you want the microphone? No, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to talk to you about gender inequality in sports. Uh, we're going to focus on football because this is there was the biggest change uh, in the last uh, couple of three years. Uh, Messi makes 100 million euros per season. It's, he's the best player, football player in, uh, in the world. And Alex if, Morgan. If you ask Ronaldo, is not. <laughs> of course, if you ask Ronaldo, yes. it's. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, in a Juventus and a half fans, so I think not. But he makes the most money. So he paid the most, the biggest uh, salary. Uh, Alex Morgan makes 400,000 euros for a half season. Why half season? Because she plays in the United States and the league in the United States only have seasons because they don't have the money to pay for a full season. And even when she was, uh, she could decide, like one time she did, that she was going to play in some other league for her half season. She did it in, uh, two years ago. She came to play in Lyon in the French team. And uh, she wanted to make the same money. So she had 800,000. But then she was injured because she didn't have any break. Even Messi have a break, but she didn't have any break, so she was injured in the games. And it's only, uh, you can see that the uh, women's sport, it's uh, the biggest uh, team in, the, in football in uh, Europe. It's Lyon, a French team. And she have a, a, her budget. It's 10 million euros. Barcelona budget is more than 600 million euros. It's, it's, so you can see how much the difference between them. Uh, if you take the, it into the coverage of sport, then you have uh, less than 5% in sport coverage women sport. And even in this 5%, it's a little bit tricky. Why it's tricky? Because when you think that it's 5%, you also need to see that it, in, in the coverage of a, in a media coverage, the coverage the same sport for men and women. So it's they say it's a, like it's a woman. Uh, you see, you can see the the, the main uh, gap between the men and the women sports. Also in the budgets, if you look in the football team of the Apollo Belsheva, who plays in the Liga Taal, in the first league of uh, the women league, so she gets less. She gets a budget that uh, the men team receives a budget that 36 times bigger than the budget of the women's soccer team from the city, from the budget city. If you see in the 1918 early budget, women's sport are very allotted 33% uh, of the sport union budget. It's for the government budget. When it comes to team sports, women team sports only receive 40.8 of the money related to the sports union. So they receive less money. They have less money to give their sportsmen. They have less money to give to their uh, coaches to, the, to make the better facilities and uh, how it affects sports. Uh, if you have less money, you will have less, you have less uh, money to invest in the football 
or in any sport at all. Uh, in the last uh, couple of years, there is a great change in Europe in uh, fo women football. This change is coming after the uh, World Cup that was in Canada three years ago in the summer. And the coverage of the television coverage that was in the United uh, Kingdom, they saw that there is a lot of fans that want to see the games. They have a final that England was participating. They saw four uh, million uh, people in in the United uh, Kingdom. So they said decided to uh, change a little bit a lot of things. Uh, one of the one one of the uh, biggest changes was it's that uh, the way that the, the collaborate between the men and the women sports. Men's soccer clubs, as an example, establish women teams. When they establish women teams, most of the women, most of the big uh, clubs in uh, Europe are established in the last three years women teams. And when they establish more teams, they they make that the more uh, fans attended in the games, more attention from the press they get. Because when you get a, a game between Atletico Madrid and Barcelona, and there is fans coming to see the game. Now they can't see the game not because of the, the in the beginning they don't come to the game because they know the players. It's because the rivalry of the teams. There is a great rivalry from the teams, so they want to see. But it's also in the audience that came, there is a difference. There's a difference between our football men players, when they play, that uh, uh, well, between the, the women. In the women audience, you see more women, and you also see more families. And one of the most uh, greatest change that you see more little girls. They came to the to, to the great to the football games, and they want to know who playing, who is the players, what are their next uh, role models. When you get you get this uh, change, you got more attention from the press because the press sees. For example, uh, last week there was a game between Barcelona and Atletico Madrid, a woman game that uh, broke the world record. It was uh, audience, uh, more than 60,000 people came to the game. And uh, of course, if you have such a big game, so the media have to cover it. So the every press, so it was uh, translated in the, uh, Spain and uh, in Europe. And uh, every press in the world uh, write about it. And then you see it. You see it that you see that there is audience that wants to see the football players, the women football players. I'm sure that they doesn't know yet who are the, the, the teams, who are the players that play in every team. But if you have more coverage, you have more money. Because somebody wants it because the the television says, okay, people are interested in that. That's interesting in football. Women football is you can make more money of that. Can make if you make uh, advertisements for the football teams. Uh, in the last in the last month, the Spanish uh, one of the Spanish television uh, companies they bought the Spanish women league. They pay, they're gonna pay nine million euros for free for the next three seasons, and they're gonna broadcast the every week free games in the television. It's something that doesn't have in any other league in uh, in Europe in sport, not only in football. Uh, when you have more money invested in the game, even you have more advertising, you, you can get more uh, training train female athletes into role models, <coughs> training female athletes into role models. If football or any sport, other sport, get more coverage on television, then you will have the, 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 the female that are the center of the that sport will become role models. You can see it in the, for example, in the two years ago, Juventus in Italy, they created a, themselves a woman team in the first time their existence. So they bought a, some other team in the first league of Italy, and they bring the best players in Italy. They understand that to make it uh, that they need to make somebody the face of the team. So they take one of the players, that her name is Sarah Gama, and uh, they make her the captain and the face of the team. And every time that they publish in Juventus, you can see her picture. And now every uh, every sportsman in in Italy knows who is Sarah Gama. 
two years ago they didn't know. And even uh, Barbie makes a dollar in Italy. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting how it works. Uh, when you invest in football or in any sports, other sports, you also get a get uh, better access to better facilities and training staff. Because if you want to be the best in anything that you do, so you have to invest in it. If people see that sport, so they uh, they make it a better access, and you increase the number of female athletes. Uh, Title IX changed the in football changed because it's more than a half of the uh, little girls and women who plays football are all from Canada or from the uh, United States. Now we're trying to change it again by uh, making uh, in Europe a lot of programs uh, that increase the players around, uh, around Europe and that they want the uh, FIFA saying that today there is uh, something like uh, 40 million women and uh, girls who play in soccer most of them, like I said, more than 50%, it's in the United States and Canada. And they want to, until uh, 2026, they want to, uh, that there will be 60 million. And most of them in Europe. Uh, that's a little bit of an example how it make, uh, how can, can change uh, by collaborating between men and women sports. You can take that example also in tennis, the big tennis uh, Grand Slams and ATP 1000 and uh, VTA to the big uh, tournaments are uh, four men's and women's together. They don't play together, but it's in, so it's in the same time and it's getting more coverage. You see it in the Olympics. Uh, in, in the Olympics, you have m women and men playing to, not in the same in the same sport, playing and coverage getting a coverage in the same time. I want to show you something. Two pictures. This is the picture of the Atletico Madrid Stadium in 60,000, like I said before, audience. Uh, most of them families. It's not only the old house, and it's uh, amazing to play in something like that. And uh, last week, a record in Italy was uh, Juventus Fiorentina. Juventus Fiorentina was breaking, and it, it's the Juventus Stadium, uh, 39 uh, spectators, 2000s. And it's amazing because it changes all what we know about uh, soccer, women, football in Europe. And it's going to be changed more after the World Cup in uh, France Sound. Thanks a lot. So we have uh, a little under 25 minutes. We'll open it for a Q&A now. Uh, maybe we'll take two or three questions at a time, and then uh, we'll let the uh, panelists answer, and then we'll take some more. So, Marguerite. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Hoffman. Um, I'm an athlete myself, and I've played in, in a couple of branches. I was on a weightlifting team and rugby national team and track and field currently. So those sports are, uh, first of all, they're not considered team sports except for rugby. Um, and second, they're very small branches of sports. And I was wondering, um, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm following the events for the past seven, eight years, and the branches uh, kind of opened up really to women. But that is due to self-promotion, mostly, not to the government change, not to policies. And I was wondering, in the States, we're talking about Title IX, how much um, did that uh, change the picture of the small sports, of sports like uh, maybe softball, I'm not sure what are the small sports in the US, but um, how did they change the picture for those unpopular sports, except for soccer or rugby or football, or maybe track and field is quite big in the US. But um, some of those little branches of sports, maybe weightlifting as well, I'm pretty sure weightlifting, women weightlifting in, in US is not a big thing. So if you could yes. comment on That's that. That's an excellent question. Um, in yes, terms... Maybe we can take two more oh, questions. Yes, please. 
Um, I couldn't quite understand why there are less coaches, women coaches, when there's so many more athletes, mm -hmm. women. Okay. Yeah, I wanted you to, your opinion about the fall in the women's coaching, because here in Israel I work with the Israel Tennis Centers, and we have six teams of girls, and we constantly struggle to get any female coaches for our teams. And the, you know, we have two right now, and it's like a struggle to produce new female coaches. So I wanted your input and what that leads to the decline, and what can we do to produce more women coaches? One last one. The benefits of Titan Line and of equal uh, budgeting are clear, but I, I wasn't sure what the perils are. What are the dangers of having equal treatment of women? Mm -hmm. So uh, to the question about um, sort of the landscape of sports in the U.S., insofar as schools offer opportunity, that's where we've seen the most growth. And so most growth occurs in team-level sports. Um, there has been growth, but less growth in individual-level sports. And then there's like a third category of what we call in the U.S. action sports. So sports that have come out in the last 10 or 15 years that are more grassroots. So if you look to the Tokyo Games coming up, surfing will be a sport um, that has a long history, but it's outside of the schools. And so Title IX has had its biggest influence on sports that are typically embedded in schools or, schools that, um, or sports that schools could easily add. So the ball sports tend to get the priority in that way. But it's not to say that athletes in other sports don't advocate and come together. We just see less of that. Did you want to? Any of the panelists have anything to say? It's, it's even in uh, soccer, you talk about tennis. It's the same thing in soccer. It's very difficult. I'm trying um, in, the, in the years that I'm working to encourage, to get a little, because they make a very uh, a interesting rule if, uh, from next year in every national team, every age, we be, must have one female in the group. Doesn't have to be head coach, but uh, right? and I think it's something that's uh, uh, very interesting for the future. It's a good move, but it is, is even for us, it's very difficult uh, to get the. Now it's a little bit. You feel it's a little bit more as the growing of the of the soccer in Israel, of the women's soccer. You feel that more girls interested, but still it's a, it's a big difference. I am in my in my academy in my national teams. I, uh, I took uh, a woman that was a goalkeeper coach, Iris Antman, the national team uh, goalkeeper, and I make her a, a coach, and now she is the U17 head coach for the team. So, but she is there, she is like 24 hours thinking about, about uh, soccer, she is there 100%, and we need more girls, we need more girls, but the thing is, as the soccer will be more, the image will be in different uh, place, and uh, all the other aspects, then you will see more uh, uh, women that's women that go to to try to be a coach. You want to say anything about the perils question? So I, I think one of the perils has been what what you all have positioned and, and what he's been talking about is why don't we have more women that are interested in coaching? And so the peril of Title IX has been the ways in which it's positioned its emphasis on athletes, but didn't provide any cultivation like what he's trying to do in terms of getting women interested in coaching. And so one of the perils of the policy has been this unexpected decline in coaching that we saw, and then thinking about sort of the other levers that we have, whether it be economic, whether it be social change or systems that would then come in. It, you know, it can't be just one individual woman trying to make her way to the top. It really needs to be systems that promote um, more women. We hear of the policy that's going to insert at least one woman into the, into the coaching staff. So it takes all these different approaches. So I think the, one of the challenges when we talk about the perils of Title IX is there was so much emphasis on the participation that the coaching just was not part of that policy. And so that's the work that we need to do now in terms of thinking about gender equality. Maybe ch challenges is a better term than perils because it's, it's challenges for the future. It's not something wrong that the Titan Man has done, but it's uh, what else we can fix. Yes, I would agree. Um, I'll use my privilege as a chair and ask a question, <laughs> and then I'll hand it over for some more questions. I have a question for Barrett. So you, uh, 
You talked a lot about the challenges, uh, uh, gender-related challenges in your uh, athletic career. Uh, and you had quite a few insights here about the role of government, the role of media coverage, the role of social exposure. I mean, growing up, I remember you being a big name. I mean, Vela Buskila, it was, you know, so, so you got this as well. So I was wondering what were the sources of empowerment for you as a, as a woman athlete as well, if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, as I started uh, in the beginning, uh, I said that I never looked at myself in a gender way. I always looked at my at, uh, sporting career and my motivation was complete. I, was, I just wanted to be the best. Um, and I think that I had um, coming from a small town and trying to, you know, I uh, started sailing in Batyam and then I moved to Tel Aviv, which was the biggest club, uh, sailing club in uh, Israel. And I started sailing with the, uh, one of the sailors which came from a very uh, well-respected rich family and I had to uh, step up coming from a small town and I am um, I think that I I grew up with a sense of uh, trying to show everyone that I'm uh, as good as them and that that was kind of my motivation it wasn't uh, coming from any gender uh, places in myself I now I understand that doing that without having any women role models around me or any strong women influence uh, it was uh, it, that that was a, a challenge because it kind of sh I, I shaped myself as, a, as an athlete I think I created an alter ego uh, in a way and I separated the mentally between me being as a woman and me being as an athlete and it, it didn't it, I wasn't the same person in a way and facing challenges uh, regarding my weight was those moments when I had to the I had a clashes between these two personalities um, and you know, in those places I think that I struggle the most um, looking for some uh, more feminine role models or more feminine influences or and when the only address I had was my uh, male figures uh, in my life, which was like kind of a circle. Uh, so my motivation, I think, wasn't coming from anywhere. Like trying to, even though I was the only girl in the club, and you know the the same. We hear these stories a lot that I was the only sailor or girl sailor. In the, I, I never thought about that. I was like a very uh, self-confident. Uh, a little bit, uh, you know, like Jewish putzka, you know, <laughs> very like uh, with an attitude. Um, I, 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 I don't think I even thought about that until really early uh, later on. Thank you. Yes, please. A uh, question for Professor Hoffman. I would like to uh, take a look at the other side of the equilibrium. Uh, we're speaking about the lack of uh, female coaches, some of the questions here. But in some uh, articles I've read in the past year, including uh, comments from Becky Hammond herself, uh, the problem seems to be uh, not only the lack of acceptance of them, but the reluctance of, uh, of women themselves to go to professional training to become coaches. Uh, and it seems to me there is something to be done also from the female part, some uh, mental change in that aspect. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on what can be done from that side of the... Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I have a question for Mr. Hoffman. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, you mentioned that uh, um, a lot of people will look at the salaries for the soccer and then kind of attribute that to kind of the revenue, um, looking at kind of the World Cups. The revenue compared, brought in by the FIFA World Cup for men's versus women's, if you look at the actual percentage of the salaries for the players, the women actually made more. Um, but kind of going from that, I mean, it's also not that simple because if you look at U.S. women's soccer, for a few years their revenue was actually higher than the men's, but they ended up making less. So my question for you is, 
do you think that salary should be based on revenue and ratings, or do you think it should be like tennis where it's just totally even for the main events because a lot of the lower events actually aren't even? Uh, I think that it's. Uh, we'll, take just, we'll take just one third question and then. I just I was going to ask Dr. Hoffman about the UN's women's national team, the lawsuit that just came up, and I, in general, I'm curious about your thoughts about that. But also, if we have Title IX to ensure this this theme of gender equality. Is there something that needs to then be done on the next level, on the professional level, to ensure that that continues into the upper echelons? A little bit into Ezra's question as well. Um, so, so in response to your question about um, the lawsuit that's coming up, um, this is an excellent case where, um, and it connects to your question too, um, when we want change of any kind, people have to come together. Um, and so we can't just rely on systems to promote the change that we want. So I think the, what the women of the national team are doing is really advocating for themselves. Um, and, and really, again, sort of shining spotlight on something that was hidden otherwise. Um, so the ways in which we think about an individual woman like Becky Hammond, to, sort of, or a group of women coming together, I, I think both men and women have to work together to think about what are the ways in which we can improve our sporting organizations. And different kinds of levers are going to do different kinds of things. And so in the case of the national team, they're bringing a lawsuit. Um, in the case of what you're suggesting um, with Becky Hammond being the only one, we need other um, sources of pressure. So whether it be the visibility that starts to make it okay for women to think, oh, well, that could be a career for me, and then do that hard work that it would take um, to, to be in that position. It's not just one system or one lever or another. It needs to be multiple approaches, and it needs to be multiple um, entities and stakeholders. So we can't just rely on board members, we can't just rely on athletes or coaches. Everyone really needs to think about what is the gender equity agenda, and then what are the levers at our disposal to try to achieve those gains. Uh, I don't think that uh, Alex Morgan have to be paid uh, 100 million euros like uh, Messi. Uh, I think uh, that it's uh, a, little bit a little bit different, because you need to invest in the money in football, in the women's football, that it will uh, grow. And then, after you invest in it, you will have uh, more, uh, like I said before, you have more coverage, you have more uh, women to participate, you have more coaches that are women, and you have more players that they are icons. And then, uh, they will be paid more than the, they, are, they are paid today. Uh, because if, when we talk about uh, the collaboration between the clubs, this is what it means. It means that the men clubs take responsibility. Uh, women's sport in 1971 was uh, out of the law. You cannot have a women team, football team, it's the only sport. If you don't have a women team to play in England in the stadium, uh, you almost all of the women football was uh, amateur, fully amateur. Then now it was beginning to be to be in Europe and it was in uh, the seventies in uh, the title nine in uh, the United States. It's to make this uh, to change it. It's to make the football teams more uh, football worldwide, more uh, been seen. Uh, in the last uh, World Cup that was in, uh, in Russia, the, the men's World Cup, uh, FIFA said that there were like uh, three and a half million, uh, billion people that watched the games. They believe that now the, the World Cup is going to be in the summer, the Women World Cup, there's going to be one billion people that are going to watch the games abroad, to, uh, all over the world. Uh, and I believe that this is what is going to be make the change. I don't think, nobody believes, nobody talks about it that uh, the men and the women will be paid uh, equally in the clubs. Uh, well, a ten-digit figure can certainly make a difference. That's for sure. Uh, any further questions? Yes. Maybe um, coming from a, like more intersectional feminist point of view, maybe any one of you has any 
comments or insights on how, what are challenges also in regards to racism and gender, and maybe also the case that happened already a while ago with Serena Williams, that she was portrayed as this black woman who had a meltdown, and in, in how far do you think this, this was a legit point to make? Or in, any comments on, on that? Maybe? I have a question for Guy. I'm interested to know your experience from coaching men to coaching women. Did, how did you adjust? Uh, how is it different? We have a lot of talk at the tennis center about you know how coaches say it's so hard to coach women. They're so emotional. You say everything. They cry. They walk out of court. It's so much women. more difficult to coach women. <laughs> this is 100%. Uh, you need to be a good coach and great psychology. Um, it's, it's the emotion, as you said. The emotion is there in every training. Um, you need to be very smart with them. You need to be very careful with them. And, uh, but it's more interesting and more challenging to coach women. It's a lot of challenge there. You see all the time, they, they even test you all the time, okay? And the uh, Do you feel that women are more I said when you I said it before before when you reach them when you get there I mean sky's the limit and it's you know as many years coach men it's not like that with men okay and and so I said this is what challenging about coaching women I think you need to reach them you need to find a way how to get their um, the, um, I would say uh, trust you, mm -hmm. they trust you, anyway they believe in you and they respect you. I'm saying you can do you can do amazing thing uh, uh, as far as the results. So Lauren, one last question, mm -hmm. then I have something to throw out there, and then we'll answer the question about intersectionality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, another question. So my, I just wanted to know how uh, if any of you could talk about maybe. Uh, sexual harassment in between maybe coaches and athletes or within uh, sports in general and maybe how that plays into what you've already spoken about. Okay, and I, I wanted to throw out there uh, a question both of the Israeli uh, contingent on the, on the panel, I guess. Uh, to me, there has been quite a few efforts on the government side, like uh, the Athena project and others, where uh, uh, in Israel there has been allocation of resources towards uh, women's sports. Uh, the results have much to show for them, I and it's not we're not there yet. And my question is, what are other things that we could do? Uh, uh, so my sense, guys said something about the uh, called the Israeli culture primitive. I don't know if that's you know maybe you know some people would say that, okay? But there's definitely a cultural barrier here. Okay, for women to be integrated in sport, Israel has uh, uh, some major cultural barrier to, to cross. Okay, even in the Israeli military, which, which was the stronghold of Israeli machoism, uh, women enjoy much more equality than, for instance, in the soccer uh, in the soccer field. Uh, so the question is whether it's, for instance, a role for a corporate. You need money for that. Okay, so Banca Poali, for instance, which is like the Israeli Bank of America. Okay. Uh, they have a uh, uh, corporate responsibility uh, uh, campaign in Passover, which is, uh, sorry, in, in Sukkot, which is part of the also high holidays, also, where they open all the national parks, also, right? Also, Pesach. Pesach also, okay, twice a year, so even it's twice a month, yeah. okay? This is in the tens of millions at least, okay? Yeah. What about, just an idea, corporate responsibility, you know, airtime costs a lot of money, why don't you buy airtime? To uh, to have you know to have women's sports on TV and the main, on Channel Five, which is the main sports channel, okay, or things of that of that nature, where there is where there's any chance for this kind of collaboration. And uh, so we have three questions: the intersectionality, sexual harassment, and the role of the private sector. I can but, start with you, since it's, it's the easiest for me. Uh, coming from the Olympic Committee, I think that we need to when we talk about. Uh, budgets and policies we need to make uh, uh, we need to understand that there is a big difference between uh, Olympic uh, sports personal uh, uh, branches and uh, soccer or basketball or ball sports uh, regarding Olympic sports there are and there are no difference between men and women the only thing that matter is the results 
if you get to a certain result, you get the funds, uh, federation-wise and uh, pers as an, an athlete as well. Um, Bank of Alim, it's a great example because Bank of Alim is uh, the, our uh, main sponsor uh, for the Olympic Committee and they took 10 uh, Olympic athletes and they are supporting them and this year it's also is the first time that he took the Olympic uh, Museum and gave it as an opportunity to family to visit uh, for free. So I think there is a change regarding the, the climate in Israel uh, with sports. I don't find it as a gender problem more than a sport problem educational in Israel. I, I believe that Israel as a society and sport is a mirror to society. I think that the, the sport is not um, is not we are not there yet as a society, and not only in women's sport, in sports in general. Simply put, we don't have a sport culture in Israel. Yeah, exactly. you can say that in a way. I think that we we are that you can see a change. Uh, thinking back twenty something years when I started, and today, it's it's different, and the the athlete uh, level, and also coaches. Um, way of life you know I don't know in football but for an Olympic coach uh, the salaries are awful so if you think why there are not too many coaches in tennis or in uh, sailing it's not only because it's not easy to be uh, a coach at all so not just being a woman and which we still know that in Israel especially women are having to have two hats with family and so it's, I think it's a problem in general, not only a gender problem. Uh, I think until sport won't be inside the education, uh, um, with the same uh, level with education, funds and so we won't see any big change and only then we can see a change in the gender as well. Jennifer, do you want to offer any last thoughts before we conclude? Um, I would say that just as a, a, on a structural level, with um, when you're talking about multiple intersecting identities, um, the ways in which school systems structure opportunity, um, we have seen the, those same challenges um, with the ways in which women of color and students of color in general get opportunity and get access to opportunity. So because our sporting system is so tightly coupled with our education system, the ways in which universities structure opportunity for students then also has those similar effects for all of our students of color, women and men included. Wonderful. So uh, I would like to conclude the panel and thank our uh, our panelists. So Leo Batal, correspondent from the Valishon, Vera Buskila, the Vice President of the Israeli Olympic uh, uh, Committee and uh, World Champion, Gaia Zui, the Head Coach of the uh, National Team in Soccer for Women, and Professor Hoffman for really a wonderful event. Thank you so much, and thank you guys for coming.